Hi, everyone. Hi, Welcome to Leaders in Supply Chain podcast. My name is Fei Yu. I'm the Managing Director of Alcott Global in Europe. Today is very special. I'm a little bit excited. This is my first podcast. And more exciting than that is that we have Benoit Duchard with us. And, uh, great to have you, Benoit. Good morning, Faye. Thanks for the invite. I appreciate it. First podcast, invite me. Very, very much a pleasure and an honor. Great. So I'll give a few words about Benoit because he might be too humble to tell him some highlight about himself. We've known Benoit for a long time, always on the top of our list to be invited for podcasts. Benoit has held a number of executive positions in very well-known companies like P&G, Kingfisher, Nestle, Nespresso, Vodafone, Amco, LVMH Group. Benoit also has done broad supply chain functions end-to-end, including sourcing, supply chain transformation, brand innovation, and so on. So Benoit, please share more about you. No, but I think you've said it all. So look, uh, I have my background is mostly uh, consumer goods, but which and I would include probably luxury into this product, let's say, as well as retail. Those are my two majors. My uh, my career is a bit unusual in the sense that I come from from the upstream, so from uh, started in procurement, and from there gradually moved into uh, embracing supply chain uh, and manufacturing, R&D, IT, uh, pretty much what used to be called the support function. So that's where I'm coming from. And throughout times, I, I come from, I came from the, from the back to, to the front, basically, all the way to communication, uh, product, and therefore having at the end quite an end-to-end sense of view of, of the business, which somehow uh, led me to specialize into a transformational agenda end-to-end transformational agenda for businesses, either in turnaround situation or, or in growth challenge situation, which I find very, very similar in reality. Uh, when there's, a, there's an urgency to, to change, to transform, uh, that's, that's my core business, basically. And that's, that's where I'm, I'm getting my kick. Okay, thank you for the introduction. I, some of our audience would like to know what makes you a unique leader. Unique. So, I, I don't yeah, want maybe to share unique. some of also your cool projects and initiatives. No, no. Yeah, I don't want to be unique. I think it's uh, it's not it's not my ego. I, I think I'm 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 hopefully not unique. Let's mm-hmm. let's put it this way. Unusual, possibly, because I think it's important to to keep an eye from for, for what you don't know, and that's always been my motivation. And therefore, what is unusual is probably what I've what I've quickly described, which is. I came to exec board position, general management position from, from the upstream. I'm not coming from sales. I'm not coming from marketing or probably the more traditional functions to, to end up leading companies. So, so from that perspective, yes, I'm a bit unusual. I'm coming from the upstream, as I said. So that means that I know what it takes to run a factory. I know what it takes to manage supply chain warehouses. I have that, that understanding of what the hands-on operations do mean. And I think that that's probably what, what is my strength, or at least what I'm, I'm trying to leverage. And, and there are two, two main things out of that, which I take pride for. One is that PASS, which is a bit unusual, give me a, a very operational savvy uh, background. Uh, I, I know what it, again, I'm knowledgeable when it comes to those kind of issues, operational issues. And the other thing is that that give me the sense of being very cross-functional. I don't take pride in any uh, functional silos. I, on the contrary, I... I think it's important to, to have an end-to-end business view to be able to connect between functions, across functions. So being operational savvy and being very much cross-functionally, uh, cross-functional, transversal focused, those are, are the two things which are probably not unique to me, but, but probably more unusual, let's say, for, again, exec members or, or, or people running sets of um, uh, companies. There are also voice right coming up among the supply chain community that we want more recognition right among the the supply chain and so they want to be viewed as value creator how do you talk to business so that they they will consider you as they will listen and understand you and also consider you as a value creator but it's much easier when you're doing both actually when when you're actually running business or running transformation end to end you you don't have to 
to take to to get that seat on on but but i understand what you're saying uh for numerous people in supply chain into broad operations to be fair there's this history of being a, a support function. The terminology in itself is, is really hot. I think the good news is that those days, those years are, are gone and gradually. And we've seen it with some kind of acceleration throughout COVID, the, the contributions of, of supply chain or, or, or broader operation is becoming uh, extremely instrumental. Uh, that becomes very strategic because that becomes a sorts of function which helps you survive and win or simply die. Uh, everybody's talking about digitalization. The, the, the concept is still pretty broad, but, but what is sure about it is that most companies, B2C and B2B as well, are required uh, step changes and, and mostly in the space of their road to market. And therefore, supply chain is at the, at the center of all of this. So, so back to your question, oh, how, do, how do supply chain people get their, their seat on the table, their, the, the recognition that their contribution can be strategic? Well, I think the, you know, the context is going to help us for sure. And second to that, I think it's also about attitude. It's about making sure that, that one, people in supply chain take great care of explaining uh, what they're doing, making it accessible for the colleagues whether in sales and marketing, surely in IT. I mean, supply chain was that good IT, it was that good collaboration with IT, won't go anywhere. But also with manufacturing, with finance and so on, this ability to connect well with the other functions, to, to speak their, their language, to, to understand their concerns, their, their responsibilities, and, and to be able to connect to that, to be able to speak the language of other functions and to explain what you're doing and how that can contribute to the business, to the broader business, to each of the functions, that, that's probably the cornerstone. Uh, that's point number one. Uh, point number two is that I think supply chain does have a, a, a key responsibility uh, and it's been there for a while. Uh, this responsibility of orchestrating the transversality, the cross-functionality. If you think about it, there aren't that many uh, cross-functional transversal processes across companies which are very key. There, there are a few, typically budgeting. Budgeting is a transversal project, uh, so it's a process within the, the company, but equally product development is. But there's one which is obvious, which is a SNOP, you know, sales and operations plan. And at the end, that process on its own is really cornerstone to managing a company more and more. As a matter of fact, it's interesting. I'm getting pretty intrigued because more and more people talk about a SNOP, whereas like, Five years ago, nobody knew um, pretty much at you know, board level, exec uh, level, people were not too knowledgeable about that. Well, now every, everyone talks it. So, but, but it's true. There, there is that element of orchestrating the transversality and that process on its own is key. And who does actually coordinate that, uh, promote it, um, administrate that process? Well, supply chain, well, mostly demand planning, but uh, within supply chain, but, but that's the importance. So that role of orchestrating, promoting the transversality, I think is, is critical. And thirdly, uh, I think the in order to get recognition, I'm not so sure the right word, but, but to get understanding of the contribution, well, you, you've got to move from talking to acting. I think that's, that's very important. Uh, expertise sometimes is a bit like, it's a bit of a dangerous game because people tend to, to sort of isolate themselves into, that's the way it should be. Well, the way it should be is one thing, but we need to adapt to each and every situation in each and every company. And therefore, the ability to adapt to the company, to, to get to action, to figure out what we need to do in that specific company outside of all sorts of recipes, the ability to move from words to actions and, and to deliver results, to, to demonstrate the, the value contribution is the, is the best talk, the best speech, the best way to, to convince and, and ultimately to, to get people understanding of what the contribution can be. Speaking of action, I, you mentioned, I, I remember you told me about a very cool project when you were the COO and CTO of Remova. You also cooperate with some really icon brand like Supreme, and, and then you actually ran project in New York. And tell us about that. How did someone in supply chain and operation I, run innovation, I, running this very cool stuff in the market? Ultimately, because, well, that was, let me give a bit of context to that. So I joined that, that uh, I joined Rimova, so a luggage manufacturer, uh, post-acquisition by LVMH. And back then, the company had just been acquired. 
and and we were in need to transform the business. You now very soon we realized that you know we had a few problems in sourcing, some all sorts of issues on operationally manufacturing and margins. Well, and we had to sort of figure out a orchestrate uh, a, a transformation plan, and that's that's what I took care of. Uh, and and throughout that we had a wish, which was to to be very lean in our approach. Which, which to be very ambitious, but at the same time, um, very humble about it. And, uh, and therefore, when you want to go fast, when you want to go lean, you end up doing bits and pieces of everything. And therefore, gradually, I got involved into all sorts of things, uh, probably beyond my historical sorts of background, as well as maybe beyond what you could uh, expect. So, so sideways to running uh, operations and uh, you know, supply chain, the construction of supply chain back then, as we wanted to move to own retail from wholesale business to own retail, which is a, is a drastic transformation from, from supply chain perspective, sideways to this, sideways to um, uh, product development, because we wanted to, to revamp the product pipeline. We, we, we needed to shorten the road to market, to innovate and so on. Sideways to all of that, yes, I ended up do, doing some pretty cool stuff because one of the, the decision was to basically earn, gain or a new audience, probably younger and broader geographically by getting known through collaborations. So collaborations with uh, artists, uh, brands, and and uh, and therefore, yes, I ended up actually uh, running those collaborations, and it was that was quite fun. The one that you mentioned about Supreme was 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 kind kind of awesome. That was the first one that we really sit up did that not exactly the first one, but the one that that created the big buzz. Where from there onwards, yeah, people started to to ring us for more basically, and uh, and that was cool. Yeah. The problem though back then is that uh, retrospectively we took quite some risk when we when we basically locked that deal with Supreme. We had to pick to the market a product within six months, whereas the company had never developed anything in less than four years. So <laughs> that's a total set of change of paradigms in terms of how you how you look at developing a, a product. And that's from A to Z all the way to orchestrating the distribution of the product. You know, doing something with a brand like, like Supreme is, is very constrainful. It's, it's, uh, very, it's very ambitious because you basically, the concept is you've got to sell the product within a week. At the end, it's mostly into one weekend. So think about developing a product much faster than you've ever done before and being able to actually supply in a weekend and sell everything into one go. And that, that's, that's pretty risky, but we stretched basically the business. We stretched all the teams, uh, all the way from, from development, manufacturing, logistics, and, and so on. Of course, retail retail ops and we did it and, and we scored pretty high you know that that was that was interesting indeed there was an interesting uh, venture because from there onwards we broke a few records and therefore yeah we created some some appetite for the brown that was a broader audience uh, and and that very much helped it now after that one we did a few others we did we did more of that with again artists other brands designers We've done things with Montclair, we've, we've done things with uh, Virgil Abloh, with Off-White. We did the transparent case, uh, suitcase there. I mean, all sorts of, of pretty cool stuff. And, and to be fair, we, we earned um, our way through that, through premium luxury product by actually working out those collaborations. But that took a lot about stretching muscles uh, internally and sometimes muscles we didn't have. So operationally, quite, quite interesting challenges always, yeah. Well, fantastic story. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Vimo. Well, of course, we have five suitcases at home. <laughs> <Good point. laughs> but you know, they, last, they last very long. So, so, so yeah. bear in mind that you're buying them for your, for your children as well. So, yeah. so that continued that, that discussion, right? So because then you are still in the LM, uh, LVMH group, right? So we heard many good stories about this giant in driving innovation and still cope with supply chain challenges. So it, many organizations are suffering, but it, it looks like LVMH Group is, is doing fine. It's actually the stop. Everything is actually in place, right? So how well, does this giant manage supply chain in, in such a good way? 
I will not speak for LVMH, but if you look at broader than LVMH, if you look at luxury, and you know, you've got basically, uh, you know, the big names, right? GMH, Kering, uh, Richemont, these groups uh, have gone through massive sorts of uh, changes lately, and supply chain has been a uh, cornerstone. COVID has, has really drastically changed travel retail. Uh, a big portion uh, of, of, of the clients are actually are in Asia. When actually COVID hit, lots of things basically frozen. The travel retail did freeze. So all in all, I think all the, the, the maison, as, as we basically call them in, in luxury, all those affiliates, those brands, they had to reinvent themselves on the road to market. And, and they've done fantastic. Uh, look at the results. I mean, most, most of the companies have gone through COVID, they've recovered on sales big time, though the, the model somehow had to adapt to this and supply chain has been instrumental. The way that the digital has picked up since COVID is, is tremendous. So therefore, when you look at that, and that's true for those big luxury premium groups, they had to really rework their uh, their road to market, their, their their supply chain, and the ones the maison that have done the best, they have a very structured supply chain organization that's instrumental. We would not necessarily think of it, but the most performing brands maison they've achieved that. They've achieved that 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 step change, the ability to to deliver the product, to reduce the lead times, to reduce your inventory at the same time as you you maximize your availability. You know that requires demand management, that requires a supply network which is really top of the edge, that requires obviously a, a very straightforward connection to all your digital activities. All of this has been done for, for the ones who've been successful, that's been done in literally a few years. You know, in reality, um, people, you know, the, the, the strongest brands and the most successful, they've not done that. They've not started with COVID, uh, the job had, had started earlier. But I think that's back to your point. If you look at, I have a few in mind, but uh, what I think are the most successful uh, maison in that space, the work has been prepared long before in terms of structuring a supply chain, a network in teams, supply chain teams, very strong, very strong teams. Uh, mm -hmm. And all of that work paid off greatly uh, throughout COVID and after that. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're able to basically shift your production almost, let's say, within two months when you're able to maximize availability in stores, online, and at the same time, carry little, little inventory in boutique. That's because you're, you have a supply chain, which is really, again, uh, where it needs to be. Yeah, so you were talking about uh, capture that you mentioned the, the team, right? And, uh, and the organization. How do you motivate the, the team and keep the organization going in a climate of disruption and then all this tension of geopolitical right. tension, right? And at the same time, you need to be agile in procurement and sourcing. Keeping the, the teams motivated, I think it's not so much the issue. Uh, I think if you've got the, the right people, they, they're excited because that's, these are days where you can make a difference, where you can create competitive advantage. Back to the point, you know, you, you mentioned like uh, luxury or, or premium products. Not each and everyone has, has succeeded throughout that journey. And it's true for any other uh, consumer good business or even B2B or wh whatever. I think it's interesting times because, because it's a good time for people to create competitive advantage to con to create competitive gaps, to, to really be the, the quickest to, to rework your road to market, to optimize it. In some way, yes, there's, there's, a, there's a new era. We've got to face it. And therefore, the one who would do that best actually will sustain their future very much. So reversely, the one who don't embrace supply chain, who don't embrace procurement, who don't embrace in general operations uh, to support the growth, to, to support the, the, the business, well, I think they would they would suffer big time, yeah. And again, back to the people, the, the, the good people, they're all excited because, because they, you know, it's very interesting when you have to rework your road to market where you've got to create models out of the blue when you, it sounds stupid, but but even like going omni-channel in a, in a business when, when you're coming from a stage where you don't have click and collect, you don't have ship from, ship from store, you, you don't have basically a, a share of e-commerce uh, which is up to 40 whatever percent peak. Well, un until you've seen that, until you've lived that, 
Well, you don't know what it is, but as you build it, it's, it's massive uh, sense of innovation or it's very sense of motivating to change the business so radically somehow to enable the business throughout the different road to market. That's very exciting. You've got to pull those solutions. Again, you know, creating reverse logistics. Many people are getting into the space of uh, secondhand business. Well, secondhand business is a reverse logistic. So think about it from a supply chain perspective. No longer are you, you are on going one way, you're now looking at, you know, sorts of looking at the, at, at, at looking backwards, you know, using your networks on the way to the client, on the way back from the client. This is massive in terms of, the opportunity behind it and how do you uh, how do you generate traffic in the in the physical stores how do you make sure that you get a, a seamless experience between digital physical stores distribution sometimes when when you've got well sales well uh, how do you create that environment how do you fulfill the promise of the brand still with so many sets of uh, channels to to get to the to the clients back and forth well that's kind of motivating that's that's uh, that's not the world we used to know 20 years ago. So from that perspective, I think people are motivated in supply chain. Mm -hmm. the so one 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 yeah. in the future, for sure. What I heard is actually getting the right people on board is it's just... Uh, but it's always, it's, always, it's always the trick. You know, <laughs> people, people process systems. Yeah. I think the road is to believe that systems would sort out everything. It never does. For many moons in supply chain, in operations, the name of the game was, oh, do we have the right ERP? And, and fundamentally, you, you know, I've seen so many ERP projects failing badly that I can tell that the problem is, is never the tool. Now, as we move into omnichannel, into more digital, you know, this is much more complex. This is about fulfillment. This is about demand management. This is a, but ultimately it's the same thing. Uh, thinking that you resolve things by acquiring tool systems is wrong. Fundamentally, you need the right people. Then you need to put the, the right processes together. Mm -hmm. And then actually you sit so, um, uh, make sure you get the systems to support that, to scale it, to industrialize it, to speed up, to, to be efficient at doing all of this. Therefore, again, three pillars, but the most important is, is people. Mm -hmm. you will well, just to know that, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, like like that a lot. So actually, I'm not sure if that's the answer of my next question, right? So I wanted to ask, what is the secret sauce of a successful transformation? Well, <laughs> and the, what learnings the, can you share? Yeah, well, I don't think there's a, there's really a, a secret sauce in the sense that there's at least there is no recipe. Uh, and that's for me very important. Um, transformation is not about applying recipe. You can be very good in one company throughout a, a transformation and you move to another one. And if you apply the same suits of codes, the same approach, you will fail miserably. I very much believe, like, and that's probably coming back from, from the luxury thing, but, you know, you need to be tailor-made. You, you really need to, to have an approach which fits the, the company. The, 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 the thing which I think is important is that uh, there's, there's, I think, three things, three principles which are, which are I think, important. One is that transformation is, is never incremental. It's, it's, it's not the linear thing. It's, I think the, the best way to think of transformation is to, uh, thinking step changes. And that's the only way to actually progress significantly. As a matter of fact, transformation is when you have to do or you want to do things differently, where the name of the game is not to do more of the same, but to do it differently. That's transformational. And thinking it that way makes it that you think step change. And if you think step change, well, then you would get great results. If you think that transformation is about changing through little steps and baby steps, you'll never get anywhere. That's point number one. Uh, point number two uh, is that transfer, uh, transformation, I think, requires transversality. I've talked it a bit before, but cross-functionality is, is the key in my view. The ability to federate across the functional silos on a simple yet very holistic roadmap, adding basically uh, independent plans, objectives from various departments, that does not provide consistency in action. That's, that's not the way to do it. Uh, contrary to that, we need to have an end-to-end -end vision. And, and therefore, I think it's, it's important to factor this thing. Uh, transformation is not about adding things. It's about multiplying. It's not about adding functional expertise, you know, in marketing, in sales, in, uh, in supply chain, uh, in, um, in controlling or, or, or whatever else. It's about actually making sure that all those functions work together. So, so it's multiplying in a sense that 
what I think the best way to look at it is that you can have the best marketing team and they can score 100 after 100. You can have the best sales guys and they score 100 after 100. If your supply chain does not work uh, and score like poorly zero, well, you multiply 100 by 100 by zero and that's still zero. So, so the way to look at that, I think is important because that's actually a change of paradigms. It's if you want to, to grow the business uh, efficiently, to, to take on the challenges and to be truly transformational, you, you need to think into and you need all those functions to work well together and to perform together. And that's, that's for me, that sounds stupid, but that's not always the way that, that probably people would naturally approach things. And then the, the third sorts of maybe key principles that I think we need to keep in mind that nothing is magic in business. There is the, the best strategy on PowerPoint is worth very little without discipline on thorough execution. And therefore we need to have simple strategies. They need to be communicated. Uh, they need to be cascaded to the organization and they need to be executed. And the leaders, they need to be hands-on on the field with the teams, uh, taking on the challenges, uh, fixing the upcoming issues. Things never go the way they've planned. It's, 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 it's the rule. Getting the leaders and, and the organization to demonstrate what it is actually take to outperform is important. To outperform competitors, you've got to do things that they don't. You've got to run the extra mile. You've got to be giving up last. And that ability uh, is, needs to be demonstrated by the leaders. And I think that's important because, again, there is, there is no magic. It's pretty much hard work at the end. I have one more question, right? more technical, that's actually given by the audience. They want you to actually share with them the learning of your organization through COVID. I think so there was that mentioned right. as that, right. that COVID has shown us uh, the importance right of robust supply chain uh, related to especially people processes and system what are the major learnings in your organization for me the, the major learnings is that one is that the what it takes to be agile uh, the agility and then that goes back to the point before is that the, the companies that have done well through COVID they they've demonstrated their resilience and resilience and agility. And that's, that's very much down to the people. That's an attitude. There's no real process to it. You can orchestrate agility in supply chain. You can structurally build it in manufacturing and supply in, in the way you, you, you build your demand. But, but fundamentally, it's more than that. It's a culture of being of adapting to the situation and therefore being able to live with some level of ambiguity, to live with some, some level of crisis as well and to be resilient to that. And that's very much done to being able to lead the teams through that. To demonstrate enough of confidence, but, but enough of, of, of the ability to get people through, through the unknown, basically. And transformation, by the way, is very much about that. And so I think to me, that's learning number one. Having a resilient organization is, is, is most important. And that's a mindset. And therefore, you don't have to wait for such thing as the COVID to create it to create the bonds between the functions, between the people, the, the bonds to, to the value of the company, of the brands, that is most instrumental. Because if you have that, you can go through crisis uh, more easily than other companies. And therefore, I think, you know, we, we all sorts of had to leave and, and, and work remote and, and between Zooms and Teams and stuff. But the truth of the matter is that if we would not have created the bonds between the people, the understanding, the trust before the COVID, I think we would have struggled. At least in my space, like then I was still active on, on Rimova. Uh, mm -hmm. That was obvious. If we would not have worked with the teams, if we would not have built that, that network, those, connect, the, those connections between the people that we are working together, we would not have basically uh, been as successful throughout that journey. It's pretty obvious. So that's probably number one. Then number two, um, I think the biggest learning is, is and, and that's not a learning for people who've done supply chain or, or procurement or manufacturing or IT, but I think there's a learning for many organizations that suddenly they realize that the, the, the legs, the arms of, of their companies, they're, they're into operations. And it's, it's a fact of life, but, you know, you know, we all now talk about digitalization. Well, think about it that way is that, in reality, at, at exec level or board level, very few people actually understand supply chain. Uh, that's the way it is. But but if you don't understand supply chain, if you don't understand systems, well, you know, it's hard to get to understand what digitalization or where, where modifying your road to market, what it means actually to, to get it done. 
and that for me is the second biggest learning is that there's a there's no realization for for probably border teams beyond actually um, supply chain typically that this is cornerstone and that realization i think uh, should greatly back to your original question that should be really greatly help actually uh, supply leaders to to be more convincing to get more of a share of voice and 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 explain actually how they can contribute because because that's been uh, eye opening for for many people thank you that's really really helpful i do have one question that i will ask every guest <laughs> who is your professional idol and give you uh, a sentence to tell us why. Well, okay. I, I don't have any to be, I'm probably too much open. You know, I could, I could give you names of famous people. I, I could say Steve Jobs, I could say whoever, but no, that's not, I would not be my answer. I'm always being very curious in any companies and all the companies I've been working with and for to be connected at all levels of the organization, uh, you know, and as well as across all the functions. So, so throughout my career, I was lucky to meet some people. And so, some are very much unknown people. Production uh, in product development. Uh, I'm thinking now as of indeed someone and in, in supply chain and someone in marketing and a creative that I found really great. So at all levels, you you find people who basically uh, master their. We, we do what they do with pride. They do it very well. They master it, and though they keep learning about it, they keep being open to new ways of doing it. Those are the people that inspire me. Uh, and again, it, it can be a, a line manager on, on a shop floor. It can be a, a creative uh, director, whatever. But that's what inspires me. And those are not necessarily uh, well-known people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. I think that um, Confucius also said that you always find a master among three. <laughs> yeah, no, that's exactly it. And, and you know, if, if I, by going back to Steve Jobs, I mean, uh, for a while, you know, people loved Steve Jobs and then didn't like, like him anymore and then loved him again. And uh, this is not so relevant for me. And there's good and there's probably less good in each, every one of us. The one key thing which which I find interesting is this ability to, to challenge yourself, to, to, to open up to new ways of doing things, to be constantly seeking innovation, but innovation in a good sense, meaning like a, a, a different, better way of doing things, uh, thinking continuous improvement. You know, that's, that's what drove me into, into transformation. The name of the game is about moving from A to B to C. It's, it never stops. So that's what thrills me. And that is demonstrated by, by all sorts of people including Steve Jobs, obviously, but, but also by people you work with uh, in organization. This is great. Thank you, Benoit. I'm sure well, that you. our audience will really hey. enjoy hey. the session. There's a lot of learning here. Thank you very much. But thanks to you. Thanks to you, Faye. Thank you for listening to our podcast. If you like what you heard, be sure to go to alcartglobal.com and click the podcast button for all the show notes of the interview. Also, subscribe to our mailing list to get our latest update first. If you're listening to a streaming platform like iTunes, Spotify, or Stitcher, we would appreciate the kind review. Five Star works best to keep us going and our production team happy. And of course, share it with your friends. I'm most active on LinkedIn. So do feel free to follow me. And if you have any suggestions on what to do and who to invite next, don't hesitate to drop me a note. And if you're looking to hire top executives in supply chain or transform your business, of course, contact us as well to find out how we can help. Thank you very much.